Standing here in your presence In a grace so relentless I am one By perfect love Wrapped within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Seeking deep in mercy our teens boy we got a good uh, our next generation is going to be just fine in the music area huh well good morning we're doing a th things a little differently this morning so we will take communion together at the end of my lesson but uh, let's give a round of applause to our worship ministry again amen great stuff this morning uh, let's go to God in prayer before we jump into our lesson God thank you for this morning it's always great to be together thank you for the opportunity to sing together and just to think about your son Jesus and how amazing he is. 
Uh, we're so grateful for this time of year because it, uh, it really de- it is a festive time. It's a great time to be with family, and it's a great time just uh, uh, to really think about the birth of your son and everything that that brought forth, how it really was a game changer, how it really did move things uh, forward, how it did draw us closer to you. And we are just so grateful for this time. I pray as we get into your word just a little bit more here, God, that we are just encouraged and uh, moved uh, forward in our relationship with you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. All right. All right. You should be familiar with that uh, after this week of, you know, studying Mark uh, together. But uh, we'll get there here in just a moment. But uh, man, it's great to be a, uh, in the holiday season, isn't it? Uh, it's always a, a fun time. We got to go to Wichita yesterday and uh, spend some time with my family up there. If you would be praying for my aunt uh, Shirley, she's uh, she's uh, got some medical issues going on, and uh, we just if you could pray for our family, we'd really appreciate it. Um, doesn't look like she's going to live a whole lot longer, and. Uh, we got to see her yesterday. She was very excited to see us, but uh, just be praying for her and my family if you would. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I enjoy, I- I've said this many times, but I feel this way. It's so great to preach about Jesus. So great to talk about Jesus. Yeah. Uh, the last couple of weeks, you know, the first week we talked about, we're doing the holiday sermon series here called In Awe of Jesus. And two weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus is, how he is everything. If you weren't here and didn't get to hear it, you can go out online, okcchurch.com, or go to our free OKC Church app, and uh, the sermons are on there. You can go out and listen to it. But we talked about how Jesus is everything we need. You know, he's there to meet every circumstance, every situation. And then last week we talked about, we started to get into Isaiah, right? And we're going to read that here in just a second. We read it a little bit earlier, but just such a great passage. These rich descriptions of Jesus. And the first one we looked at last week was Wonderful Counselor. You know, how he is the one who counsels us. He gives us the faith. He gives us the drive. He gives us the advice to move forward in life, right? Well, this week we're going to look at the rest uh, or two of the other parts there in that Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And of course, you don't need to turn there because you're in Mark. But uh, Isaiah 9 says, for, uh, for to us a child was born, to us a son is given. The government be on his, uh, shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, which we looked at last week. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Man, so amazing to think about Isaiah preaching this hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus, saying, this is what you will call the Son of God. This is what he will be to you. And today we're going to look at this mighty God and everlasting Father. These are two characteristics that are huge. Mighty. Think about mighty God. Mighty, possessing great and impressive power of strength. Dominant, influential, strong, powerful, important. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about someone who was there at the creation of the world. Someone who has all power. Someone who is all powerful. Someone whose very presence Cause people to fall to the ground. Cause people to fall to their knees. Cause even the most proud to become instantly humble. Mighty God. Then everlasting Father. Lasting forever. Eternal. Endless. Never ending. Perpetual. Undying. Abiding. Enduring infinite, boundless, timeless, father, dad, papa, daddy, pop, pa, whatever you want to call him, right? Think about that though. There's such a cool dichotomy there, isn't there? Mighty God, mighty God, the most powerful man who ever walked the earth, but everlasting father, 
non, never dies, never will go away, daddy. All that wrapped up in the person of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? You know, I think about Jesus being described as the lion, right? The lion of Judah. But then on the other side, what is he? He's the lamb, right? The lamb, the sacrificial lamb. And you see, it's like these things almost seem like they're completely different. There's such a dichotomy there. This, this mighty God, this everlasting father, all wrapped up in Jesus. How powerful, how amazing, but yet how caring and how loving. It's just, it almost blows your mind. All week long, I was like, this is just, this is crazy that this is all in Jesus. But that's why we worship him. That's why we follow him. That's why he is everything to us. He's the dominant creator and the eternal daddy. He's the powerful deity and the infinite papa. He's all powerful and, forget and forever caring. And when we look at Mark chapter 5, what's really cool about this section of scripture is that it really does embody both of these things in it. Mark chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1. You guys with me? Yeah. Mark 5, verse 1, it says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had strength to subdue him night and day among the tombs and on the mountains. He was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torture me or torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. And then you uh, step down to verse 18 there and said, and as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Man, this is Jesus, the mighty God and the everlasting Father. He traveled across the sea just to meet up with this one guy. A man who could not be any more of a pain to everyone around him. <laughs> a man who was full of demons. A man who had lost control of his own life. A man who was abused both physically and mentally. A man who had given up all hope. A man who had been discarded. A man that thought he could never be normal again. This demon-possessed man that no one could subdue. Who would think that such a man would ever be worth saving? But who could change the course of this man's life? Who could subdue the powerful and out of control? Demoniac. The one we call the mighty God. That's who. Isn't that the power that we need from Jesus? Isn't that the power we so desperately need? During this part in our life, don't we just need a daily dose of this mighty godness just about every day? But we also need that side of Jesus, the everlasting father. We have the mighty God because this guy was full of demons, legion 
of demons within this one man. He's bound by chains. No one can subdue him. He's cutting himself with stone. He seems like the absolute least likely person to do anything for God. But yet, what does Jesus do? He takes a special trip across the sea because he's the mighty God, but he's also the everlasting father. No one else cared for this guy. Everybody else said, we're done with him. We've put chains on him and he rips the chains off. Can you imagine how strong somebody has to be to rip chains off of him? But yet, when the everlasting father, when the mighty God steps in front of him, what's he do? He bows down. Part of that, I think, was the demons were afraid to be tormented. The other part of it, I think, was the man himself going, please help me. Because I know you're the everlasting father. Isn't that cool? We see in this little section here, the amazingness of Jesus. That he's both. That he sympathizes. That he empathizes. That he cares. That he's somebody that we have the old devotional song. You can have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your struggles. But yet he's the mighty God too. It almost doesn't make sense. But it's amazing. That we get to have this in him. But it doesn't stop there. Go a little bit further here. Verse 21, Mark chapter 5. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side... He went back, (laughs) a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. You know, this always amazes me that the synagogue ruler, one of the most influential guys in the community, saw the mighty God and the everlasting Father and said, this is who I need. It wasn't like him doing that was socially acceptable. As a matter of fact, we don't know what happened later, but more than likely, if the other religious rulers saw him doing what he was doing, he probably would have had to renounce his leadership. Because they all weren't happy about Jesus. But guess what this guy said? He said, my daughter's dying. There's only one person who I trust. It's the mighty God. And it's the everlasting father. He's the only one that can do anything to help me. On his way, and we won't read this part because we're going to skip down. But on his way to to take care of Jairus' daughter, he runs into another woman. And this woman was subject to bleeding. It says, I don't know what was going on there. But it had been going on for a long time. And this is how amazing Jesus is. He's on the way. And this is a dire situation. And he knew it was dire. Because Jairus came up and asked him. It had to have been a desperate situation for somebody in that stage to come up and say. Okay. I need your help Jesus. But even in that he goes. Wait. I've got to help this woman. I've got to help her. I've got to stop. The everlasting father. I can't let her suffer. I got to help her. I know that situation's dire. And as a matter of fact, I've got a little plan for that one. So no hurry. But let me take care of her first. And then it goes on. Verse 35. Right while he was still speaking. There came from the rulers. um, From the ruler's house. Some who said. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher? Any further but overhearing what they said jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue do not fear only believe and he allowed no one to follow him except peter james and john the brother of james you could always tell when the three were coming with him there was going to be a teaching uh, opportunity right and probably something that was going to blow your socks off too right They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion. People weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, 
Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Jesus is awesome. He's like, you know what? She's been out for a little bit. She's hungry. Let's take care of this girl. You know? Jesus again shows how he's the mighty God and the everlasting father. He raised a girl from the dead for crying out loud. Have you guys, do you think about that ever? Like how amazing this is? We're so kind of numb to it because we're Christians and we've heard stories of resurrection from the dead. But just think about what that would have been like. To lose your daughter. To die. Because of a long illness and Jesus comes in and says, nope, she's not dead, she's asleep. Yeah, whatever, dude, get out of here. What's your, you're crazy. But then he goes and he just says a couple of words. And she rises. That's power. That's the mighty God. But it's also the everlasting father. Because he cared. He cared enough. And he cared about their faith too. He said, don't worry, just believe. He wanted them to see that, man, if I can raise the dead, there's nothing I can't do. In your life. In anybody's life. I know sometimes the Christmas season can be a little bit heavy. There's things we're looking at. And and it, it, you know, I was looking at my aunt yesterday laying in a hospital bed. And I was like, man, this doesn't feel like Christmas. It's pretty challenging to see that. It's pretty challenging to see my dad cry. It's even more challenging to see my brother who never cries cry. And you look at those things and you go, what? But I know this. I don't know the answers to any of that. But I know this. Don't fear, just believe. Because I know Jesus can do anything. He can do anything. And the things that he doesn't do are for a reason. But he can do anything. Man, you look in your situations in life and you might think, man, this Christmas is hard. I can't afford to get things for my family that I want to. It's a little bit challenging financially. There's different things going on, but you know what? Don't fear, just believe. Because Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. I'm reading these things to you to give you hope. Because Jesus is all you need. When it's all said and done, everything you have is going to be gone. Except your relationship with him. And he is beckoning you. And he can do amazing things in your life. And you may feel like you're legion. That nobody cares. That I'm just being tormented. You may feel like you're the woman that was subject to bleeding. You've just had a chronic illness your whole life. And you wonder if it's ever going to change. You might be someone who's dead spiritually like the little girl was. Thinking, man, I've got nothing. You might be like Jairus. Hey, please, Jesus, come help my friend. But know this. He will work. Because he's the mighty God. And he's the everlasting father. He will do great things. He can do whatever's needed. You just got to go to him. You just got to ask him. You just got to go lay in front of him. You may be the one who's all prideful like Jerry. It's all like, oh, you know, I got this. And it takes desperation to get you there. You might be the one who's sick and feels like nobody's going to help me. You might be the one who's tormented. But guess what? In all those circumstances, he didn't say, oh, Jairus, now you come to me. He didn't say to Legion, oh, now you're going to do something. Now you're full of demons. He didn't say to the woman subject to bleak, oh, now you're desperate. He never said anything about that. He just said, I'm the mighty God. I'm the everlasting father. And I got you. 
just go to him. Just go to him. No matter what your scenario, no matter what your situation, if you can't get faith from this, I don't think you can get faith from anything. Because this is the mighty God. This is the everlasting Father. Look over in Luke chapter 23, because we're going to take communion together. I really tried to find something in Mark to match this, but this story here in Luke is what really came to mind for me. But it says here, I, I love that, man, this part, you want to talk about mighty God, everlasting Father, Luke chapter 23. Verse 39 says, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed, and we indeed justly, for we are, um, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus called out in a loud voice and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breast. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Isn't it amazing? What do you see in there? You see the mighty God and the everlasting Father. He's hanging on the cross. If you've ever studied what crucifixion was like and all the things that led up to the crucifixion, Jesus was not in a good place physically. Okay? He was, you see these little pictures of a Jesus with a little blood. It wasn't like that. And here he is. And I think every one of us would have been justified, including him, to just be worried about how we felt and where we're at and how unjust this is. But what did he do? He looked over at the guys, one guy who'd been yelling at him and one guy who's yelling at the other guy and says, guess what? You're going to be with me in paradise. Another part of the scripture says that he looks down on his mom and says, John, I want you to take care of my mom. What? Are you kidding me? He cares about other people even when he's about to die? Yes, because he's the everlasting father. But yet what's amazing is even in his death, we see the mighty God. Because what happens when he dies? The centurion's like, surely this man was innocent. Why did he say that? Because he saw power. He saw power even in his death. He saw the humility of Jesus. He saw the love of Jesus. It says people went home beating their breasts. They were convicted at what happened because they saw the mighty God and the everlasting Father even in His death. That's who we worship. That little baby that was in the manger, in the cave, in the hay, amongst the cows and the goats and whatever else was in there. That little baby... He would be called Wonderful Counselor. He would be called Mighty God. He would be called Everlasting Father. He would be called Prince of Peace. And he would die on the cross for me and you, demonstrating a power and a love that we'll probably never get our arms around, but is amazing as amazing as it was then, it's even more amazing now. 2,000 years later, here we are. So grateful and celebrating at what's happened for us. Let's think about that as we take the communion today. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you just for the blessing 
of the mighty God and the everlasting Father. We're so grateful for Jesus and everything he's done. It's so amazing just to see in such a short passage of Scripture how he took care of those around him and how powerful he was. This guy, Legion, so strong that no one can subdue him, yet he doesn't even have to touch the guy, and the guy is humbled before him because he's such a, he is the mighty God. And then to see him just love the guy and ask him what his name is and, and cast the demons out and, and then to go back across the sea and, and to encounter Jairus and to encounter the woman that's subject to bleeding and the little girl and just the love he had, but yet the power he had. And then to see him on the cross, to see him care more about others, even to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When he's in pain, when he's in emotional turmoil, when he knows that soon he's going to be, have to be separated from God for a little while. But to see that everlasting father within him that's caring even for those around him in that time is just amazing. And then to see the end of it where the centurion says, surely this man's innocent. To see mighty God, to see everlasting Father. God, we're humbled today as we take the communion. We don't deserve to do this in remembrance of him. We're, we're fortunate to be able to take the bread that represents the body and a cup that represents his blood. We are blessed to be able to be cleansed by that, to be able to have this time. And I pray in all the greatness of the Christmas season, which I love so much, we won't forget this very fact that that little baby grew up with a great life for us and he died on the cross and he came back again so we could have a relationship with you and we'll be forever grateful and indebted. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen.